Uh, the next speech is by what's <laughs> Dustin uh, from Pi, Texas. And he's also from working for Google. And he will bring us PEP 572, the wireless operator. <laughs> Hey everybody, uh, I'm Dustin. Uh, so like he said, I am a developer advocate at Google. Uh, that means that I represent the Python community uh, inside of Google internally. Uh, I'm also organizer for PyTexas, which is a regional event that happens uh, in the States every year. And I also work on the Python package index. Uh, so this talk is about PEP 572, uh, which is a relatively recent PEP. You might have heard of it. Um, but before I can start talking about PEP 572, I need to talk about Python governance first. So Python governance is the question, or the answer to the question, how do we govern the language? Like, how do we actually make changes to Python? Who votes and decides on those decisions, and how are they enacted? So in Python, we have a BDFL. This stands for the Benevolent Dictator for Life. So dictator here means that he can do whatever he wants. And benevolent means that generally he's going to look out for us as Pythonistas when he's doing whatever he wants. And this is our dictator. This is Guido Van Rossum. So the thing to note about these decisions that we make in Python when we change them is that Guido doesn't actually make all these decisions himself. He doesn't just do it by himself. It's much too work for him. Instead, what we do is we create a PEP. Uh, PEP is a Python enhancement proposal. Uh, and the PEP is kind of like, uh, it's kind of like amendments to the constitution of a country. So uh, Python sort of has a, a basic constitution, and then we write PEPs that amend it, that change it, change the standards of the language, change the way the syntax works, and things like that. So since the constitution kind of determines how a country is governed, uh, each PEP sort of determines how Python is governed and how Python works, and how we change basically the law of Python. Uh, can anybody name a PEP? Eight, yeah, PEP8. So PEP8 is the style guide for Python code. Uh, the author of PEP8 was Guido Van Rossum himself. So this is one of the early PEPs that Guido actually did write himself. Uh, another popular PEP is PEP20. This is the Zen of Python. Uh, the author of this PEP was Tim Peters. My favorite PEP is PEP566, Metadata for Software Packages 2.1. The reason this is my favorite PEP is because I am the author of this PEP. <laughs> All right. So when I wrote this PEP, uh, this is kind of what the process was like. So first, I had a draft, and I shared that draft with some people that were interested in it. Then that draft was sent to someone for acceptance. And then finally, once it was accepted, implementation. We implemented it. Now, the thing to note here is that Guido himself didn't actually approve my PEP directly. I'm actually quite sure he's probably never read it. It's about specific stuff about Python packaging, and Guido mostly works with core Python stuff. So what happened instead? Instead, we have people that are called BDFL delegates. And so these are people that Guido and other core contributors have entrusted with the ability to, to approve and make decisions on PEPs in Guido's stead. So it kind of looks like this. So at the top, we have Guido. And then we have the delegates below him. And then each of those delegates get the opportunity to uh, review and approve or disapprove PEPs. And sometimes Guido still approves PEPs himself, but usually this is the way it works. So PEP 572 was a PEP called assignment expressions. And you might have heard about this because it actually caused a little bit of drama in the Python community. So this is the syntax change that uh, was responsible for all this drama. It has a name. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Instead, I'm going to call it the walrus operator, because it kind of looks like a walrus lying on its side. And by the way, I gave this talk once before, and someone was really concerned that this walrus was dead. Uh, I want to uh, advise you that this walrus is not dead. He is just resting. <laughs> OK, so the walrus operator, what do we do with it? Let's, uh, let's look at some examples. So first is the walrus operator helps us balance lines of code and cyclomatic complexity, so our actual runtime of our program. So for example, if I have a function like this, uh, or if I have a, a variable assignment like this. So I'm creating a variable foo. It's a list. It contains three items in it. Each one is a call to f of x. And one is raised to the power of 2, one is raised to the power of 3. Let's say that calling f of x is really expensive. Like, let's say it takes a full minute. So what's the problem here? It's a little inefficient, because we're calling f of x three times. 
but we actually only need to call it once. So what you could do here is take that call to f of x and bring it out on top. So that's nice. It's a little more efficient. What the walrus operator lets us do is take all this and do it in a single line. So instead of having a separate variable declaration on the previous line, we can do it inside the creation of that list. So here I've created a variable y when I assign that first value of the list, and then I can reuse y later in that list and only on that line. So this will let us reuse a value that's expensive to compute, but also still keep it on one line of code. Another thing the walrus operator lets us do is avoid inefficient comprehensions. Okay, what do I mean by this? So here's an example. Uh, you don't have to worry too much about what it does, but it starts with an empty list. It iterates over something. It calls a function on the result. It does some testing, and then it puts the results in that list of results. All right. Usually when I see some code in Python that looks like this, it's kind of a code smell to me. I see that I have an empty list that's initialized at the front and then a for loop that builds that list. And I realize that this usually means that this should actually be a list comprehension. So we could take this piece of code and turn it into a list comprehension, and it would look like this. And it'd be a little more clear. It would do the exact same thing. And it would also be more inefficient, because instead of computing f of x once here, we're going to do it twice. We need to do it once for the test, and once when we actually put it in the list or iterate over it. So while this looks nicer and is less lines of code, it's actually not great for the runtime of our program. With the walrus operator, again, I can create a variable inside this comprehension and that I can reuse later in it. So it turns into this. I'm assigning variable of y in the test, and I can reuse it when I'm actually iterating over the list. So this is called sharing a sub-expression between comprehension filter and a filter clause and its output clause. Another thing the walrus operator lets us do is avoid unnecessary variables in scope. So for example, if you've ever used regular expressions, you've probably written something like this. Uh, we're going to search some data for a match on a regular expression pattern, and then we have to test if match exists or not, because usually sometimes match is none, sometimes it actually is this regular expression object. So you have to do a thing that kind of looks like this. With the Wallace operator, I could just do this. I could define match inside the if statement. And then that variable match only exists for that if statement. It's in one line of code, and it's very clear that I'm only planning to use that match variable inside that if statement. Another thing that we could do with the water operator is process streams and chunks. So if you, let's say you have a really long file name, and you want to read it piece by piece, but you have to read that first chunk first. So what you do is you read the first bit, and then you iterate over it. You process the chunk, you read a new chunk, you process the chunk, you read a new chunk. And this is a little, you know, it's a little like duplicative, right? I have that number, whatever that means, 8192, I have it twice. So if I ever need to change that, I have to change it in two places. It'd be nice if I only had to do it once, but uh, there's not really a great way to do it here. We always need to get that first chunk. With the walrus operator, I can just get that first chunk inside the while loop. So I can do this. This is just like that for loop or that if statement where I can just have the access to chunk inside that while loop. And it also frees us from having to initialize the chunk variable before we enter the while loop. Okay, you might look at all these things and you might say, why? Uh, all the code before like, worked pretty well. Maybe some of it was a little inefficient, but it's not really a big deal and it's not the end of the world if that's the way you write Python code. It's totally fine. All right, so why do we need the walrus operator? Well, the first argument is that maybe fewer lines are better. Maybe it's better to write less lines of code for Python uh, if you have the ability to. So basically, reducing the number of lines of code you change when you create pull requests and things like that, uh, it may, means that there are less lines of code for your teammates to review. It'll be easier for them to understand what you've written just because it's simpler. OK, maybe that's a good argument. So if we can take something like this and turn it into something like this, uh, your coworkers will love you, right? That's like a 50% reduction in code. Sometimes, though, fewer lines are also more efficient. So when this PEP was first introduced, some people went around and found examples of places where the walrus operator would have helped make code, less e or make code more efficient. So another one was an example like this. Instead of writing uh, this search on two lines, they found an example where a programmer had done this. They really wanted to be on one line, and so they just put it all in one line like this. But again, the problem here is that you're calling read.match twice. If this is a really long regular expression or a really long piece of data, this is going to be inefficient. It's going to be twice as slow. So with the walrus operator, they could have turned it to this, and it actually would have been more efficient. 
So ultimately, this becomes this trade-off between the developer, developer efficiency and the efficiency of your, of your program. One other thing about the Waller separator. It is not, you might say that it looks kind of like the equals operator, and it even kind of looks like it, right? Uh, it's actually nothing like the equals operator. And pretty much everywhere where you can use the equals operator, you cannot use the Waller separator. So for example, with the equals operator, you can write something like this first line, where you set z, y, and x all to the same thing. But with the Waller separator, you can't do that, right? Even if you use uh, the, the, the parentheses like this, it's not possible. Another thing that you can do with the equals operator is assign things to things inside of lists with, uh, you know, other than a variable like a, a list or uh, some other expression. You can't do that with the walrus operator. With the assignment operator, you can also set uh, attributes and uh, on things uh, like objects. You can't do that with the walrus operator. And also comma priority. So with uh, the first line here, you would get a tuple of one and two. With the Waters operator, you would actually set x equal to one, and it wouldn't prioritize the comma here. And the last one is the augmented assignment operator, the plus equals. You can't do that with the Waters operator, and actually, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. I don't even know what you would call that. It's kind of like Waters with like Pope hat on top. <laughs> okay. That 572 was submitted as a draft. And basically, the reception was not that great. The thing to note is that most people really hate change. And programmers especially hate change. They don't want to see things change in their language. So some of the reception, some of the arguments when this was first proposed were things like this. So first, backwards compatibility. Where is this going to work? So the thing to note about this is it's not backwards compatible at all, right? If I use the walrus operator, I can only use it in the version of Python that supports the walrus operator. Older versions of Python won't understand what it means, and they will call it a syntax error. So that's a valid concern. Another is teachability. What do we call this? So at the beginning, I said I wasn't going to tell you what the name of it. And we can't really call it the Wallace operator, although we kind of do now. But what would you actually call this, this operator, right? If you're trying to teach it to someone, what would you say it does? You can't call it the assignment operator. That's the equal sign. You can call it the becomes operator, named expression operator. So the last one is the actual name, a named expression operator. But if I told you that I'm going to add a named expression operator to Python, it probably wouldn't even tell you what it does. You'd have to come watch a talk like this. Another argument is attractiveness. A lot of people just didn't like the way it looked as Python syntax. It's just ugly. Like, I don't want that in my Python. And so this resulted in a lot of debate. There were long, endless discussions on mailing lists. They went on and on and on. There were polls. They polled the core committers to see who liked it. 8% uh, said they liked it. 76% said they didn't like it. And some of the sort of uh, leaders of Python had some things to say as well. So for example, Tim Peters, he's the one who authored PEP20. Uh, PEP he said that the current proposal would have allowed a modest but clear improvement in a few lines of code. He saw places where uh, the Waller Slapper would have made code more efficient or more readable. Barry Warsaw. Uh, he said that since it changes the syntax of the language, people tend to focus on that without understanding the deeper semantic issues. And this is definitely true. You could look at the walrus operating Python code and immediately see what it looked like. Ugesh Langa, another core contributor, he said dictators should dictate. He thought that Guido should just do whatever he wanted and not listen to anyone else. And in fact, Guido himself said that he had to stop reading the threads so that he wouldn't go insane. So a little while later, after all this discussion, eventually, Guido went to the PEPs repo, and he changed PEP 572 from draft to accept it. He accepted the PEP. And then he did this. He sent an email to the Python core contributors mailing list indicating his transfer of power. He said, now that PEP 572 is done, I don't ever want to have to fight so hard for a PEP and find out that so many people despise my decisions. So he's going to remove himself entirely from the decision process. And he said, he'll still be here, but we're going to have to figure out what to do. This was huge. Guido is basically stepping away from his role as BDFL. Some people's reactions to this were interesting. So here's one person. And way before the, the Water Software had been existed, he said, Dear Python, all I want for my birthday is that chunk example I showed before. And then he said, I just realized, thanks to 572, I'm getting what I wanted. But at what cost? Guido is stepping down from Python. Uh, Hennick said, Pet 572 rocks. What a farewell gift. Uh, this person says, 
TFW Reddit says pep 572 lost the Zen of Python, but the author of the Zen is a co-author of the pep. That's kind of funny. Uh, this person said, Gideon Van Rossum is stepping down as PDFL of Python. His first line, he's shocked by the vitriol that we throw at people who run the important free and open source software projects. People were so angry about this that it caused Gideon to step down. And this person. This person said, PEP 572 is a trash feature, and I'm sad that it was the straw that broke Gita's back. And I saw this and I'm like, hmm, let's be really clear here. If we're talking about straws breaking people's back, the straw that broke Gita's back was not trash peps heaped onto him by pep authors. In fact, the straw that broke Gita's back was when people were calling his work trash by people on the internet, right? Here's the thing, dictators are people too. Guido is a person. Maintainers are people too. People who work on Python and maintain the language, they are just people at the end of the day. Really, let's just say, people are people too. I think a lot of people forgot that Guido is just a person. All right, so some questions now. Let's see where we're at. What does this mean for Python? So I gave this talk once and someone said, is this gonna be the pep that ends all peps? And that was kind of true, actually. So because the power to approve and deny peps comes from Guido, him stepping down meant that all the other people also couldn't approve or deny peps. And that meant that we couldn't have any peps. We couldn't do anything with Python once Guido had stepped down. And thus, we couldn't change the language. Here's the thing. It's going to be OK. Immediately afterwards, some really smart people in our community got together and started working on the governance problem, basically figuring out what we're going to do. This is what they did. They created PEP 8000, which is a general proposal overview for what we're going to do for the governance question. They created PEP 8001, which outlined a voting method, a timeline, criteria for participation, and an explicit list of people who could vote on the question of how we're going to govern Python. They did a survey of other similar open source projects, uh, other programming languages, other big open source projects, and they saw what governance models worked and didn't work for those projects. And they also wrote a lot of other PEPs. So all these other PEPs were proposals for ways that we could govern the language. And they range from everything from basically complete anarchy to something that's very similar to what we already had with the dictator model. In December of last year, there was a vote. And this vote was only limited to core developers. And they voted on these proposals to decide which governance process we'd have. And we selected one. So based on the outcome of this vote, they selected PEP 8016, the steering council model. And this was proposed by Nathaniel Smith and Donald Stuff. And the acceptance of this PEP meant that the next thing to do was to have another vote to determine who actually would be on the steering council that would guide Python. So in January of this year, there was a vote, again, only limited to core developers. And those people elected from the list of nominees the five people that make up the Python steering council that we now have today. So these people from left to right are Barry Warsaw, Brett Cannon, Carol Willing, Guido himself, and Nick Coughlin. Okay, some more questions. Will the Walrus operator become part of Python? And actually, it already has. If you were able to get Python 3.8, which is almost about ready to be released, uh, an early version of it does have the Walrus operator in it, and you could download it and play with it today. Uh, this is implemented by one of our core developers, Emily Morehouse, and it's, it's awesome. You should check it out. You might say, I don't like it. And that's fine. You're entitled to your opinion. If you don't like it, though, just don't write it. You, no one's forcing you to use the Walrus operator in your code. You can get by just fine without it. So if someone is on your team is using it and you don't like it, it's your job to convince them either that they should or shouldn't. Another question, is Guido coming back? Well, so it sort of depends on what you mean. Is he coming back to Python? Yes. He's on the steering council. He's really going to still be, continue to be involved. So yes. But is he going to come back as a BDFL? No. We have the steering council now, and it works really well. And the thing to note is that Python is 27 years old. And at this point, Guido is kind of like its parent. It's time for Python to go out on its own and make it without Guido. Another question, will this happen again? And again, this kind of depends on what you mean. Maybe you mean, will another pet be this controversial? I'd say probably not. Uh, this pet was maybe an outlier. It described a really small syntax change. It was really obvious and understandable to a lot of people. And it caused a really strong reaction. But maybe you actually mean, will people be negative on the internet? And I'd say, I don't know, maybe. 
I hope not. I hope that we've learned a lesson from this, that as a Python community, we should all be a little nicer to each other, especially when people are proposing new ideas. But who knows? Uh, a lot of people, many people, so many people use Python now. And for most of those people, the language already kind of feels like it's perfect. They don't want to change anything. So I don't know. Maybe this is the new status quo. Maybe Python is never going to change. I sure hope not, though. Thanks, everyone. minutes left and um, only one question on the side right now uh, it's about oh, will it show on the screen okay so let me repeat the question would you recommend the team cooperate to use the virus operator given that most of the team follow the Google Python style code uh, so you might notice that in this talk I didn't actually make a recommendation of whether you should use this or not. I didn't actually even really express my opinion on this operator. And here's the thing. I think that this should be your own decision to make. You should form your own opinion about this operator and then go from there. Um, you shouldn't necessarily rely on the opinions of, of other people. And you know the Google Python style guide is nice, but it doesn't say anything about the walrus operator right now, and it probably won't for a little while. So. Yeah, I think this is a decision that you have to sort of read the pep, experiment with it a little bit, and figure out if it works for you or not. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah, if you want to ask uh, directly now, you can just uh, turn on the microphone in front of you. Anyone? What is your opinion of the Waller software? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, you put me on the spot. Uh, I plead the fifth? No. Uh, I, I think that it's, you know, it's like a very small change, and it's optional, right? You don't have to use it. So uh, I think, yeah, there's some places where it looks quite nice. I actually was on the fence about it after all this was happening. And then one day I was, I was writing some Python code, and I was like, oh, this is exactly where you use it. I wish I could use it right now. So I think I found a place, at least some places, where I would probably use it. Uh, I'm not writing a lot of Python 3.8 code right this second because it doesn't totally exist yet. but. Uh, yeah, once it does exist, I'm excited to, to find more places that I can use it. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. All right. Uh, I'll be around afterwards. Happy to talk to anyone about this. Uh, thanks again for your time, and it's great to be here. <laughs>